Hi, I'm Jim Ziegler, the Executive Director of the National Iron and Steel Heritage Museum, and welcome to our site here in Coatesville, Pennsylvania. Uh, we are on the site uh, built originally in 1810 of what is now the longest continuously operating iron and steel plant in North America. And we will show visitors many things here, including this office building uh, built in 1903, and then other buildings on the site. Uh, we have steel made here that went to the World Trade Center in New York. Uh, other pieces that are here uh, that are of interest and other buildings, uh, particularly our visitor center, the motor house, and two mansions. Uh, one Victorian we call Terracina and one uh, is a collegiate Gothic style of architecture uh, we call Greystone Mansion uh, that was built in 1889. So all within one city block we have 14 acres which is a national historic site. Uh, it's a landmark uh, in the uh, Department of Interior's uh, designation of site. So all the, all the buildings are on the registry and this is a landmark. So welcome and I uh, hope you enjoy uh, your visit here. This is the visitor center, uh, something we've done recently. Uh, we are on the site of a 110 acre working farm originally in 1810. This was the site of the original barn. So what the exhibits we have in here, of course, are from the colonial period up to the present. Uh, in this portion, we have the colonial period. Uh, we also are indicating what you will find in this area. We have the minerals, uh, the water power, which is the Brandywine Creek right next to us, all the components going into iron making at that point before steel making came around. And we have an exhibit of Rebecca's original mill behind me. Uh, actually, it's Isaac Pennock's original mill. Isaac was Rebecca's father. Uh, we talk a lot about Rebecca, but it was Isaac Pennock that originally founded this. Uh, Isaac's family had received a William Penn land grant uh, in southern Chester County, and Isaac made his way up here. So we have those components from earlier um, colonial steel make, uh, iron making up to steel making, and some of these exhibits uh, are hands-on exhibits. It's our Please Touch Museum where people are not terribly embarrassed to try to lift these small pieces of steel. Uh, it's extremely um, heavy. Steel that came out of Coatesville became many very iconic buildings. Of course, the World Trade Center uh, is the exhibit that we're showing here, but also the Seattle Space Needle, the St. Louis Arch, the Verrazano Bridges. For the locals, the Veterans Stadium that used to be in Philadelphia. Um, many, many iconic buildings uh, that you would recognize. In this case, uh, Plant 4 and 5 uh, produced the steel which became the World Trade Center, among other products, but we're exhibiting here the flat steel plate which was flame cut into three prong trident sections, uh, which became the uh, top portion of the uh, lobbies and the first office floor of World Trade Center Towers 1 and 2. Uh, left here in Coatesville and went to Pittsburgh, and was boxed into columns, and then from Pittsburgh went up to uh, Manhattan, where it became uh, what were known as uh, Towers A and B, under construction, one and two, uh, while they were occupied, and became known as the North and the South Tower the day of the disaster. The question that we often get is, when did the plant close? It hasn't closed. It's just not Luke and Steel anymore. It actually began as the Brandywine Iron and Nail Works under uh, Mr. Pennock. Uh, was then later named, many years later, for Dr. Charles and his wife Rebecca Lukens and became Lukens uh, Iron and Steel Company and then later the Lukens Steel Company, which it was up until 1998 when Bethlehem Steel purchased the plant along with its plant in, Lukens' plant in Conchahawken, 
At that point, it had been Alan Wood Steel in Con Conchahagen. So 98, then into the early 2000s, it was Bethlehem Lucan's Plate. Um, Bethlehem was purchased by ISG, International Steel Group, who was purchased by Middle Steel. Middle Steel and Arcelor combined, they're a European company. They are currently the world's largest iron and steel uh, conglomerate. Uh, and then last year, uh, Cleveland Cliffs purchased the North American assets of uh, ArcelorMittal. So it is currently the Cleveland Cliffs Coatesville steel plant. Also here we have the furnace display. Um, very hot, uh, very loud. Uh, they use scrap, so the scrap goes into the furnace uh, up to about 3,000 degrees or more. Uh, white hot, as depicted here, and then port, uh, eventually coming out to a rolling mill. In this case, we have an exhibit of the 206-inch rolling mill. There are two rolling mills at the plant, the 140, which is the workhorse, and the 206-inch uh, rolling mill, which at one point was the world's widest plate. This area displays other types of products that are used from the steel that comes out of the plant. In this case, it's a spun head. So the plate is heated, cut in a circle, reheated, and spun, and either pushed up or down to become a hemisphere, as depicted in um, the image behind. And those hemispheres can then be welded to something, either a tank, car, oil tanks that you see, uh, or a sonar sphere, which we have in our parking lot, um, which is two hemispheres put together. And also the guppy, a submersible, is two hemispheres put together. And you can see the sonar sphere and the guppy here at the site. One of the questions that we also get is why so many trains? Well, the iron went into the steam locomotives originally. Um, boilerplate is what Luke and Steel was known for making. Uh, so steam trains, steam ships. Uh, and in this case, we have a display of about 400 different trains, which were gifts from uh, one of Rebecca Lukens' descendants C.L. Houston III, or Skip Houston, who's on our board. Uh, his son, Scott Houston, is our president. Uh, when we were converting this from a barn to a visitor center, we decided we needed to get these trains out of storage and on display. We have a variety of gauges here. Uh, they've all been set up without track, and if you've ever put a railroad display up, you know that that's an engineering marvel in itself. We're fortunate that one of our board members, Al G. Antonio, who started out at Baldwin Locomotive and is uh, on the board of the Friends of the Pennsylvania Railroad in Strasburg, uh, converted this type of a display without track, and also it's interchangeable. So the G gauge can go in the middle, these risers can come out, these are the shelves they can pull out, you can put the larger trains here. It's already pre-grooved, so it can go wherever you want it to go. Uh, so lots of trains, but the uh, original function and even the current function uh, from the steam locomotives, currently the heavy steel uh, goes into the undercarriage or the truck of the locomotives and cars. In this area, we interpret ships. Uh, the steel, the iron and steel that came out of Coatesville went into a variety of ships, steamships, yachts, um, naval uh, ships. Uh, we read recently when ArcelorMittal had their newsletter, it stated that 90% of the U.S. fleets of aircraft carriers, battleships, and destroyers had ArcelorMittal steel in it. Uh, so a lot of that plate came out of Coatesville. Coatesville is known for its uh, armor plate. Uh, and then Liberty ships were cargo ships uh, converted into bringing the troops home from World War II. 
one of which was actually named the Rebecca Lukens. So that's what this corner displays. Uh, Liberty ships were built at a pace of about one per week. And if you can get a copy of a time-lapse video showing that construction, it's absolutely phenomenal. What I'm trying not to stand in front of are some interesting other vehicles made with the armor plate that comes out of Coatesville. Of course, in World War II, you have the Sherman tanks, uh, A1, A, uh, M1 Abrams tanks in Desert Storm. Also, Humvees and MRAPs uh, are using uh, armor plate uh, basically out of Coatesville. And Coatesville has retro to the um, ships uh, the current contract to replace using Coatesville Steel, the current naval fleet of submarines for the next 10 years. Also here, we have a display showing racing yachts, particularly the America's Cup racing yachts. And originally, back in the late 1800s, they used iron reinforced decks and hulls because the speed at which those ships move and then the turns that they take, uh, the wood would splinter without that reinforcement. So that helped them. Of course, today, those, those uh, racing yachts are fiberglass catamarans. Nevertheless, it's an interesting race, the America's Cup. Luke and Steel uh, was in several of the winners of the America's Cup. Um, also, we do have a lecture series that we show online, and we've learned a lot through Zoom. Uh, and a recent series was Women's History Month with the female, all-female crew of an America's Cup team uh, in the mid-90s, uh, Dawn Riley is the skipper, and without leaving Long Island, she gave a presentation, and her audience in New England mixed with our audience here via Zoom, interacting, and it was just a wonderful uh, lecture. So you might want to take a look at our website and all the components there. This is the motor house for the 120-inch rolling mill. Uh, these buildings were built in 1942, went online in 1943. They were built by the U.S. Navy. Uh, the U.S. Navy uh, used Luke and Steel workers to manufacture plate, armor plate for ships. So this was a shipbuilding operation in here until the end of the war when the Navy sold the buildings to Luke and Steel. Uh, behind us, here we have the Guppy. Uh, the Guppy is a shallow dive submersible made with Luke and Steel by Sun Ship Company for Sun Oil. Sun Oil would use them for rigs, inspecting oil rigs. Uh, this particular ship was on display at the Independent Seaport Museum until recently. Uh, the smile on the front was uh, put on by the museum, Seaport Museum, and of course it got a lot of attraction coming down 76 here to Coatesville. Uh, but actually in our records we have found that when the Sun Ship Company transferred these to Sun Oil, they would put great big ruby red lips on the front of her with mascara around the portal. So uh, they, everybody had a lot of fun with the guppy. Also in this area we have a test lab where small batches of steel were made uh, in furnaces that we have. Um, we have metallurgists that are just itching to have demos here. We have a rolling mill, so they would make a small piece of plate and then test it in this testing equipment uh, to see the tensile strength. They would twist it and turn it and pull it and bend it. When the, the steel passed the test needed, uh, then they would make a big batch and put it in the furnace and then make a big plate of steel. Uh, also in this area, we have fire equipment. Lucan's Steel, now Cleveland Cliffs, has its own fire equipment. Uh, when accidents happen on the plant, they need immediate responses. So they go and do that, and then Coatesville comes as a backup. We have two engines and an ambulance which are in full working order, and uh, we put them in parades, particularly the ambulance, uh, she's in good shape. 
Um, she's actually been in some fundraisers for other groups because she looks like she was in Ghostbusters. Uh, so that's the equipment that we have in this section of the motor house. So again, the motor house is known for its motors. So you see that in an early rendering of what the motor house looked like back in the 40s uh, when it was in operation, uh, very loud. These motors provided the power to run the five ton crane up above us. And there's a 100 ton crane on the other side of that wall. Also on the other side of that wall is the uh, the bed for the 120 inch rolling mill. So there was a 120 there at one point, which is why this building was built. But Lucan Steel purchased a steel company in Conshohocken, which was Allen Wood Steel. Allen Wood also had a 120. So that purchase went through in the late 70s, early 80s. So this, this building became dormant in 1983 almost 40 years to the day of when it went up during World War II. There are several things that we interpret from this location. Uh, the main source of this story is the sonar sphere here next to me, uh, named for just that, sonar, sound, sphere, its shape. So it is two spun heads, uh, pieces of steel which have been pushed or pulled into a hemisphere. In this case, the spun head is welded together and each of those holes contains a hydrophone. Hydro, water, phone, sound. So the sound, the little listening devices, now 2,700 hydrophones will go into those holes and that is a listening device that goes into the front of a submarine. Uh, this is about 20 tons of steel. It fits into the nose of the submarine, and that submarine is so big, it would extend back to Business Route 30 behind us, perhaps beyond. Uh, so this we found uh, decommissioned in Maine, uh, brought it, shipped it back here, uh, and uh, it was through the good uh, contributions of our friends, um, the uh, McNeils, Bob and Jennifer McNeil made this possible to come back. The driver of the truck that brought it back was a sailor. Uh, so he knew exactly what his payload was the whole way down from Maine. He was extremely excited when he got here. Also, we interpret what's going on, some of the sounds of steel making, the sights and sounds of steel making just across the Brandywine Creek, which is the reason the iron plant was originally established here. This is the west branch of the Brandywine just beyond these railroad cars. Those buildings are where the steel plates are cooling. Uh, in the old days when I was a kid, there were open hearth furnaces there with the tall smokestacks billowing smoke out over town. That's west, that's east. So the prevailing westerlies carried that smoke over town. Uh, that just meant they're making steel. We got brooms and we brushed off the sidewalk, weren't hurt by the uh, steel. I was before OSHA, obviously. Electric furnace is down south of us, uh, less than a mile. This is a piece of steel that was made here in Coatesville and made its way to Pittsburgh on up to New York to become the, just the top portion, the fork shape where the prong or where the windows were in uh, World Trade Center Tower 1, uh, later known as the North Tower. So um, the rest of the steel, there's the welding joint. There were two more sections of the column down to the ground level and then at least three more sections down to bedrock. If you've been to the Memorial Museum in New York, uh, they start at ground zero and take you down to bedrock and you can see the outlines of where these steel columns were. So the Coatesville steel was just the lobbies and the first office floor of Towers 1 and 2, or the North and the South Tower. It's about 30 tons of steel. Uh, we talk about World Trade Center here. Uh, we do have a commemoration at September 11th, but the rest of the year we uh, do talk about the iconic buildings 
uh, that this represents and the steel that came out of Coatesville to help contribute to those buildings. ArcelorMittal Steel Company and the United Steelworkers uh, Chapter 1165 erected the memorial behind me. Uh, on it are the names of those who lost their lives while making steel here in Coatesville. Uh, there are different alphabetical order. There is no order. Uh, dates, no chronological dates. Uh, there are 83 names on there. And um, they went to work one day and didn't come home, very similar to the folks uh, in New York and in uh, Somerset and at the Pentagon. So that story is told here for steel workers, uh, not for September 11th. Uh, so it's a remark, it's a variety of accidents um, that people succumb to, uh, injuries from over at the plant. Uh, it's great, great job, but uh, very dangerous uh, and remarkable the types of products that they put their lives on the line for, for us. We are in the building that housed the 120 inch rolling mill that operated from 1943 to 1983. Uh, the components also here include the 27 pieces of the World Trade Center steel, one of which is uh, next to us in the parking lot. Uh, so you have cranes in here. Behind me down at the end of the building was the rolling mill itself. Uh, a large 100 ton crane would be behind me, uh, which operated within the plant. Uh, locomotives, there are rail lines here to our west. Uh, locomotives loaded here and rolled out. So uh, quite a bit of activity was in here right now at storage until we re-erect uh, the north uh, east corner of the North Tower, which is the steel that's here. We're in the home of one of Rebecca and Charles Lukens' grandson. This is A.F. Houston. Uh, this home was built in 1889, the year before the company went public. So they wanted to show future stockholders that Lukens Steel was here to stay. So it has a very rustic type of a feel to it, a, a different from the house where this gentleman grew up across the street, Terracina, uh, which is beautiful, uh, a Victorian mansion. This is collegiate Gothic style of architecture. Um, it was built by the, or um, designed by Cope and Stewartson architects out of Philadelphia, who also did buildings at Bryn Mawr and Haverford Colleges uh, University of Pennsylvania in Princeton, and many buildings at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, it's because of this architecture that we probably are as a historic district and National Historic Landmark. So 1889, beautiful architecture, beautiful fireplaces and building cabinets, uh, just stunning to see. Terracina is an 1849 mansion it is a country Gothic style of architecture. Uh, it was the home of uh, Rebecca and Charles Lukens' daughter, Isabella, and her husband, Dr. Charles Houston. Both Dr. Lukens were, and Dr. Houston were Philadelphia physicians who left their practices and came to Coatesville. In Dr. Lukens' case, to make iron for his father-in-law, Isaac Pennock, and for uh, Dr. Houston's case uh, to make uh, iron later steel uh, for his mother-in-law, Rebecca, as she neared retirement. Uh, stunning, stunning uh, verandas and porches and grounds uh, at uh, Terracina. Well, thank you for visiting us at the National Iron and Steel Heritage Museum. We are in Coatesville, Pennsylvania at 50 South 1st Avenue. Uh, please visit our website at steelmuseum.org. Uh, lots of exhibits and ways to get here and uh, phone number is 610-384-9282. Thank you.